Uh, let's go ahead and get to our second guest here. We have uh, Margie uh, Meacham. She's the Chief Freedom Officer at Learning to Go. Uh, Margie, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. So tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're doing over there at your company. Okay, well, Learning to Go is an instructional design company. What we do is we take what the business or the organization needs to achieve and we apply neuroscience so that people can learn and enhance performance most effectively. And I've been doing this for about eight years now, and since it's my company, I decided I could have any title I wanted, and I picked Chief Freedom Officer. Well, that's great. So maybe we'll kind of start a little bit towards the beginning here. I know your career started in more like high-tech sales, and you eventually got promoted because of the director of training, and then maybe you could talk about what it is about training and teaching and helping people you know, learn that has become a driving force behind you know, what you do now. Sure. And to, to talk uh, even further back, I first got interested in how people learn and how the brain works when I was a little girl in grade school because I was having a terrible time learning how to read. And my family had to help me to keep me from being held back. And it wasn't until I was in college I found out that I was dyslexic. So while I was learning how to be a teacher myself, I learned that there are these things called learning disabilities and it has to do with the way your brain works. So that got me really interested in what can we do to help people learn and get better. Then I got my my degree in teaching. I'm ready to start my career. And, well, I found myself in sales instead because the best way to make a sale, particularly in something that's very complex, is to teach the buyer how it works and how it will benefit them. So that's how I built my successful track record, as you said, in high-technology sales, which inevitably led me into training because they wanted me to teach other people to sell the way I did. And, you know, once I got back into that teaching kind of parole, I realized it was making those light bulbs turn on for other people that really got me excited. So that's how I ended up back in the learning profession. Well, that's a fascinating story. It always ends up that... For some people who do something very well, they're usually then asked to manage and teach. And for some people, that is a fantastic path, and they really find you know, something better. But for other people, that can be a nightmare, and that's not really what they were meant to do. <laughs> and so they, oh, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, they, most of my colleagues would, felt that way. They felt trapped in the training department where I really thrive. Yeah, and that's it's a great place uh, that for you in that that realm that you ended up there. So you were one of the first corporate trainers to use you know, video conferencing as a part of that e-learning tool. Uh, what led you to working with this medium initially and kind of moving away from traditional training models? Well, you know, I got really lucky because you mentioned I was working with a high tech company. One of their products was video conferencing. And so they sold the equipment and the bandwidth you needed to do it. And their vision was this would be great for business meetings. And I recognized the potential to use it for training. And so I had access to something that was really bleeding-edge technology way before most trainers did, you know, because it was already there and I could use it without adding to our our cost base. Mm -hmm. So I began using it for sales training, and it really took off in there. So how did it then kind of all fit together, or maybe how does it fit together now and how what you're doing now, or were they simply just kind of a stepping stone to get to where you are today? Maybe you can kind of talk about you know, the progression from that point to now. Sure. Well, I was the director of training, and I started the, um, I don't know if this is okay to mention, the uh, company name. They're still around. They're a great company called Intertel. And I started Intertel University. And as part of that, I started talking with all kinds of vendors and different people that I could pull into the university. So I became really knowledgeable on the different platforms and the different technologies. And I began to realize also that those consultants made a lot more money than I did. So that's when I went out and started my own company. Mm-hmm. And as time has evolved in the learning space, we've gone from the old way we used to deliver video conferencing, which we tried to replicate more of a television show, but we didn't really have the lighting or the skilled speakers and the expertise to do that and to do that live. Now what you see a lot of is live learning online will be either something like this, it'll be a live broadcast, or there might be um, a video connection, and we'd call it virtual training, and people could see my screen as opposed to... um, 
me trying to make it feel like I'm right there physically with them. It's not always necessary for the learning to take place to have that kind of an experience. So I think we've gotten a lot smarter about the technology. So to answer your question, yeah, I still use it, and I use it a lot for my clients. But the way we deploy it is much simpler now, and the way we put it together is much faster. And the the experience for the person on the other end is usually much more consistent. Mm Mm-hmm. So you, you now have kind of taken all that knowledge, and now you're working with a lot of different companies and designing their learning experiences for them. Do you find there are maybe some important aspects that really go into a successful learning and training program that a company needs? I mean, sometimes it's, you know, at the management level, employee level, or there's a leadership component. Maybe there's something else. Do you kind of have some key things that you see them doing successfully? Yeah, I think there's one thing that every business needs, and that is they need to make sure they're preparing their employers, their employees, rather, not just for today, but for the future. Things are changing so rapidly in technology and in business and globalization business that you can't predict what skills your folks are going to need two years from now. What you can do is make sure that you've taught them how to think so that they can analyze the situation, and you've taught them how to learn. So we spend a lot of time with our clients on what we call learning to learn. We actually teach people how to become better at extracting as much as they can out of a training course. That way, my clients spend less on training because we do it much more efficiently. And absolutely everyone at any level of business, really at any age, the younger you are, the even more critical it's going to be because of the world you're going to face in 10, 20, 30 years. We all need to learn better, and that's where the neuroscience comes in. Well, I really notice that as being a common thread in people who are sort of identified as very good teachers, whatever level they are. I think they spend a good portion of their day and every lesson that they're doing reinforcing or teaching their students how to learn, how to find the information, how to critically break it down, and how to think about it in a way in which that you know is replicatable when they're not standing there in front of the teacher. Yeah. And that's just as as important as whether or not I think that you whether you've learned the information at that moment. But how can I go find that out for myself and critically break it down and make sure I have the right information and move forward as opposed to just I think there's a huge maybe that's you know, one of the huge problems in our society is people don't probably know how to learn something and so therefore they avoid it they don't do it and there's a lack of that progress on an individual level. Do, do you agree with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head. And, you know, it's um, it's not only that we have to teach them how to learn, but we have to make them more aware of how their brain really works. Mm-hmm. So we've got all this great information coming out now from neuroscience. Only in the last 10 years or so have we really been able to watch the brain while it works, so that's why now you're hearing so much about it. And so when you know, for example, that your brain has to, have something repeated many times before it moves into um, long-term memory, then you'll realize how much you have to study if you really want to master something. Whereas learning how to find something is a little bit different. You have to train your brain to remember the breadcrumbs to get you back to the information. So the more you know about how your brain works, the better a learner you become. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you've written some some great books, uh, and you have one coming out as well uh, later this year around this topic of neuroscience. Um, it's a topic we've, we've hit a few times here on the show, and everyone approaches it a little bit differently and how how technical or not technical they get, or even with scientific terms. But maybe you could sum up a little bit in a nutshell. You know, if someone is looking at opening up one of your books, what, you know, what, what types of things are you going to be talking about or exposing them to or getting, getting them to think about? Oh, great question. I think what they're going to find first is it's written in plain English. When I have to use a scientific term, I uh, I do so that I can be accurate, and I always provide my references. So if you want to go back to the source data, you can look at it. But I know that what most people want is they want me to boil it down for them. So I explain things in plain English, and I make sure I tell you what it means to you, how you can apply it. So my first book Brain Matters, How to Help Anyone Learn Anything Using Neuroscience, is just that. It's a series of short one- or two-page essays about some aspect of the brain that we've just discovered that you can apply, like, Mm -hmm. for example, mirror neurons. And you've probably had folks on the show talking about that. 
when you watch me do something, your brain responds just as though you were doing it yourself. And that's what those mirror neurons are doing. So we can use that to speed up the process of learning a new skill or um, sharing expertise if we understand that, we build the training in the right way. So one of the things in that book is a practical outline of how you can take advantage of mirror neurons. And I've got, oh, about 100 of those tips in that first book. Now, my second book that you mentioned is coming out later this year, I wanted to focus on one particular aspect of learning. And so what I picked was the subject of genius. What makes somebody really exceptional? And I found a huge surprise. Most geniuses made themselves geniuses. To some extent, they made a choice very early in life and worked on their brains and developed habits. So my book, The Genius Button, How to Unleash Your Hidden Genius, is going to talk about that. And I'm really excited about this because I think tied with what we just talked about, you have to speed up your learning. You have to know how to do that. This next book is going to give you practical tips on how to do that. And do you see there's a component to this that is not only what they do to improve themselves, but we have to kind of deal with the mindsets that people have as well? Because if they don't yeah, you're right. they don't believe that they can get smarter, that they can be a genius or, or what have you, they're kind of stuck, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, and that is another uh, one of those essays that I wrote in the first book, In Brain Matters, Um, Angela Duckworth is a brilliant woman who's done a lot of TED Talks, and she started getting us all talking about this concept of, she calls it grit, and it's belief in yourself and commitment to do better. And the people who don't let adversity knock them down, the people who say, I can get better at this, I can learn this, it doesn't matter what their IQ is, they're the ones who end up on top. And so she's been encouraging school teachers, parents, leaders, office managers, and even individuals, that you need to develop grit. And I agree with her. Yeah, I mean, I kind of really got formally introduced to some of those concepts through that book, Mindset, by uh, Dr. Carol Dweck. And that really gave me a pretty good understanding, although it wasn't, I don't know if I'm particularly prepared to help those who have a really bad case of... I, I can't have more of a fixed mindset that I can't change, but it's certainly you can identify people and employees um, that you can surround yourself with people. If, if you're in that growth mindset, if you want to get better and you want to work at things and you're willing to make mistakes and learn from them, there's a group of people out there that are very much already in that mindset. And it's a lot easier, I find, a lot easier to work with them and to get things done with them than it is those that believe things just are the way they are and then nothing's ever going to change. Yeah, that's right. It's like finding your tribe, right, Chris? Yeah. Find the group you're going to be most comfortable with that are going to nurture you and not hold you back. And, you know, you talked about the fixed mindset, uh, mindset, and the thing that's really remarkable that's coming out of all of this, one of the first things that come out of neuroscience is your mind is not fixed. It's constantly changing. You and I right now are rewiring our brains because of this conversation. We're going to think about things a little differently and see the world a little differently because of this interchange, and so is everybody who's listening. So it's never too late, and that's the big, big um, learning for all of us is even if you think that you can't change, something might happen in your life that reroutes one of those neural pathways, and suddenly you start to change. Well, I'm just going to be looking for that button that turns me into a genius because you said there's hey, some there's well, one somewhere, I'll right? When it's ready. <laughs> well, you know, one of our favorite questions to ask, and um, hopefully you have a great answer for this, is what are you reading right now, and can you tell us about that book? Yeah, well, I'm uh, reading a book that's been out for a few years. It's called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, and the reason I'm reading it has to do with my book that's coming out about the genius button and trying to uh, make sure that I'm covering all my bases. So this is a book by Michael Gelp, G-E-L-P, and it's called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, and he walks through different ways that Leonardo was just, he lived at a time when it was possible for one man to be deeply knowledgeable about just about every discipline in the world. So he was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was a writer. He uh, was an amazing chef 
which is something a lot of folks don't know about him. He was considered one of the greatest political minds of his day. And he moved so seamlessly between those uh, different skills, he didn't really even think of them as different. Mm-hmm. He kept copious notes, and we learn a lot from his notebooks. I had the pleasure of going, in fact, to a, um, a display of some of his notebooks. And to think that you were looking at a piece of paper with ink, and that this man so long ago touched it and put those thoughts on that paper, it was really just sent chills through my my whole body to look at it like that. And so I'm really having fun with this book. Well, that sounds like a great book. And I know, I think at least one other guest has mentioned that one before, and he's a certainly a fascinating uh, person in history that uh, the, the, there must be volumes and volumes that we can learn from him. And specifically to your kind of focus, to his process, to the way in which he learned, the way in which he approached things, I'm sure that there's some great applications there in our own lives and uh, on, on how we can uh, improve and get better and, and hopefully find that, that genius button as well. Yeah. And you know, Chris, if I could, I'd like to give you another book that I just picked up. Sure. And that's Leading from the Heart by Mark Crowley. And what I love about this book is we've discovered through studying the brain how important our emotions are to learning and changing behavior. And yet in business, we're often told to leave our emotions at the door. And Mark has realized that everything is emotional underneath. Mm -hmm. And so a good leader figures that out and draws on it rather than trying to push it away or box it up. So I think that's also going to be a great read. I've, I've sat and had a discussion about you know, negotiation settings, that people make their decisions based on emotions. They then immediately try to validate them with objective information and, and facts and figures to, to you know, really justify that emotion. But it's an emotional decision that causes Absolutely. them to make that. And I've had people really argue with me about that. And in the end, they usually end up coming back maybe years later, and they've sort of tested this out and come back to the conclusion that, yeah, it really was, it is emotional, or they, they realize it themselves that they're making those emotional decisions. They feel safe, it feels right, it, you know, it feels bad, it, it feels good, whatever those, those things are. And then we have those intellectual pieces. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, because right. your brain is, can emote faster than you can think. So... It will size up, um, you know, and, and the great book Blink was all about that, too. So if you're acting on emotion, there probably are facts that led up to that emotional reaction in your brain. It's just that the emotion is something we become conscious of first. It's the first thing that happens. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you having you on the show here today, Margie, and we've learned a lot, and it's always a fascinating topic to, to get into the world of, of neuroscience and how the brain works and training, and you did a great job of not uh, getting too scientific for us, uh, not to lose anybody here on, on malignums and all those different terms that we sometimes hear on, on, on the show that people bring up. But uh, if people are interested in learning more about your company, maybe they want you to, to help them with their own training and learning processes at their company, what's, what's the best way for them to reach out and get a hold of you? I'd say they should go to our website. It's learningtogo.info, and to go is spelled out T-O-G-O. So learningtogo.info, and there's plenty of places there to uh, a contact button, places to learn about me, and also check out our conference. We're doing an online conference November 10th and 11th, and we'll be focusing on how to bring out your inner genius during the entire conference. Well, that sounds fantastic. I'm sure people would love to give that, give that a whirl and check out your website, and uh, hopefully you can help a few of them out because uh, it looks like you've got a, a great program, a great thing running, and a lot of uh, experience in this role as well and uh, can really help people change their mindsets and their uh, how they learn within companies. Thanks. Yeah, so I know we didn't get to everything today, so we'd love to have you come back at some point, but it was really a, a, a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks, Chris. I enjoy it. I'll come back after I have my book done. How's that? Sounds great. 